Uh, I love working for the Open Spaces Authority and getting to explore the different incredible lands around San Jose. Uh, but today our presenter is fellow nature enthusiast, Michael Hawk. And he knows a lot more than I do about this subject. So I'm really excited to hear what he's gonna share with us. So without anything else, Michael, take it away. All right, thank you, Michelle. So yeah, um, I'm Michael, as Michelle just said, and I'm about to take you on a tour of the incredible insects that are so critical for the food web. So I'm sure many of you are wondering who I am. Some of you I saw on the list know, um, I know personally, so it's nice to see you. But uh, if you don't know me, I'm a naturalist based in San Jose, and I'm also a docent with the Open Space Authority, which is how I got connected to this wonderful organization. It's right in my backyard. And uh, I'm also a certified California naturalist and a creator and host of Nature's Archive podcast, among other things. But I want to be clear, I'm not an expert on the topic today. I'm just an enthusiast. I, I love nature and I love to learn and share. So uh, I, I did, by the way, I heard a great quote from a Cornell entomologist recently before he was about to present. And he said that everything I'm about to say is slightly wrong. And that's because biology is just that complicated. So as an amateur, I think everything I'm about to say is certainly going to be slightly wrong at times. So there's always exceptions, generalizations, and unknowns. If you spot something where I need to update my knowledge, please type in the chat, let me know. I'm happy to correct anything that is incorrect. So I'm going to jump right in and set the stage with a couple of quotes. I promise all my slides aren't these walls of wo words. It's just, uh, just a couple. Um, so I'll read this one. When the world was ending for the first time, Noah took all the animals two by two and loaded them aboard his escape craft for evacuations. But it's a funny thing, he left the plants to die. He failed to take the one thing he needed to rebuild life on land and concentrated on saving the freeloaders. So you might be thinking, wait, I thought this talk was about insects. Uh, and Why are you calling them freeloaders? And uh, what I like about this quote is it's not meant to be a commentary on Noah's story, but it succinctly states how inseparable plants are from animals and especially insects. So plants can obviously live on their own, but to support the diverse array of life that we love, we need the insects too. It's a community uh, and it's a community ecology as you're about to see. And this quote was really timely, it came from an article in the New York Times just a few weeks ago, profiling freelance entomologist and ecologist, Charlie Iceman. I added a couple of words to it. So it's a paraphrase actually, uh, just to give the context, but it says the average person sees insect bites, leaf mines, and galls as disfigurements. They ask their nursery store or Google, how do I fix it? And I know that this audience here is not average. You came here because you're interested in insects, but even if you're a little bit skeptical about that quote and what I have to say here, I hope by the end, you'll see that those insect bites are actually a great thing. And we need to forget about the paradigm of plants as decorations and adopt the paradigm that we and our properties and uh, all of our environment are necessary and part of the food web. So I'm hoping, you know, to be overt, to recruit you all to help deliver this message and raise the bar and create a new average. So what it says, the average person sees this, hopefully in the future, that won't be the case. So of course the plant insect relationship is critical for food webs and, uh, and you know, everything we're about to talk about. And perhaps the best starting place for this is this common example. I think most of us here know the story of the monarch and the milkweed. It's a classic plant and insect relationship. And as the story goes, the milkweed is generally toxic to most animals due to the chemicals that are in it. And the milkweed also secretes this milky latex. It's really thick. That's another anti herbivory defense that it's developed over the years. Despite this, somehow monarch caterpillars rely on milkweed. The adults lay their tiny jewel like eggs, like you see here. And when the caterpillar hatches, it has a feast awaiting it. It's the, the plant and no other plant will suffice. So if milkweeds disappear, so do the monarchs. So backing up somehow millennia ago, who knows when monarchs decided to participate in what's commonly called an evolutionary arms race with the milkweed. And through some luck or coincidence in those early days, it was able to eat the milkweed and tolerate the toxic chemicals. 
The plant, of course, doesn't like being eaten, so over time it adapts stronger and stronger defenses. Currently, I would say the monarchs are probably just a quarter step ahead in this evolutionary arms race, uh, but even then, as it stands right now, a substantial number of monarch caterpillars perish when they encounter that thick milky latex. They essentially choke on it, so it's a very close race. Now, at some point, I learned that there are actually many different species of milkweed. In fact, the genus has over 200. And this is one of the many times where, as I've been on my journey of discovery for the last several years, where I thought what was one species turned out to actually be an array of species filling complex ecological niches. And here's four of the milkweeds that we have out west. There's more than this, but narrow leaf milkweed, showy milkweed, slim leaf milkweed, and common milkweed. As a quick aside though, I want to share an important and critical mistake that I made. So don't plant tropical milkweed if you're in the United States. So learn what your local native milkweeds are. And if you want to plant one, plant one of those instead. In recent years, it's, um, it's been evident from emerging research that tropical milkweed can actually be disease vectors and cause other problems with monarch life cycles. And these are often marketed in nurseries as native and local, uh, but they aren't. So make sure that you have a critical eye for the milkweed that you do plant. But getting back on track, it's not about milkweeds today. Uh, remember I said that the, the, the milkweeds do disappear, so do the monarchs. And um, this co-evolutionary arms race means that monarch caterpillars aren't adapted to eat any other plant. And this is known as an obligate relationship. And one of the lessons that many people take away from the story of the monarch and the milkweed is that this sort of obligate relationship is unique, but maybe you'll be happy to hear, maybe you'll be unhappy to hear. It's not very unique at all. In fact, there are tens of thousands of similarly amazing stories of insects relying on very specific plants and very specific methods. And these stories really form the foundation of our food web. And that's the main point for today. These insect-plant relationships are complex, fragile, and critical for the food, food web. So I'm already 14 slides in, and I managed to avoid any sort of table of contents slide, but I think I owe it to you to at least give you a peek at where we're heading today. So the main point today is to show how important these insects are to the food web. And because everything is hitched together, as John Muir famously said, the native plants are probably more important, but that's another webinar. So this presentation is going to focus on the insect side of the equation. And to establish a baseline, I'm going to go do some lightning fast review of some ecology basics. I promise it will be quick and painless. And, uh, and then we're going to take a look at a number of strategies that insects employ to make a living. And th this is what I think is super fascinating and why I wanted to do this presentation. But since that itself is a huge topic, I'm going to further focus on herbivory strategies, or basically, uh, when I say herbivory strategy, it's basically the combination of the relationship and lifestyle that an insect has related to eating plants. So they're herbivores, and, uh, and that's what we're focusing on here. We're not going to focus on um, other insect lifestyles. So each strategy that I cover today, I think is fascinating, and many of them are happening in your own yard or in your neighborhood park. So I hope that you'll uh, be able to look at those areas with a uh, newfound interest. And lastly, I'll end with a few suggestions as to how we all can help solidify the, this foundation of our environment. So let's do the quick ecology lesson, starting with this photo I showed a moment ago. And here again, we have that villain of a milkweed, the tropical milkweed that we should not plant. Um, but uh, it's showing that it's attracted some yellow aphids those are called oleander aphids. And despite the name, they're actually probably more common on milkweed. I've seen them much more often on milkweed. And then those light green ovals that almost look like inverted balloons with a string attached, those are the eggs of a lacewing. So larvae of lacewings are voracious aphid eaters. And the adults are smart. They saw these aphids and they knew to lay their eggs right where the food is. So this is community ecology in action. But let's take, well, I should say, let's look a little bit more deeply as to what's going on here with these interactions. And 
yes, I'm going to start with some definitions and I hope I don't bore you like these people on the slide. I'll make it quick. So first of all, uh, ecology is the study of relationships between organisms and their surroundings. And a community, of course, is the groups of species that are interacting within an area. So we throw those two things together and that's a community ecology. And that's what I'm hoping to show you today, how these herbivorous insects interact with the greater communities that they're part of. And to really think about this, uh, if you're an animal, you eat something and regardless of your diet, you can thank plants for that. So this diagram here shows what are known as trophic levels. And trophic is just a fancy way of saying relating to feeding. You may have heard the term trophic cascade in the past, and that's a, a similar concept based on how things filter through the trophic levels. So plants are called producers because they're doing all of that heavy lifting that we talked about a moment ago, converting the sun's energy into carbohydrates and sugars, and that fuels the world literally. And that's why they're at the base of this diagram. And then herbivores are the primary consumers that come along and they convert that newfound energy from the plants into proteins and fats and other forms that essentially enable the predators and everyone else. Now, of course, this model, it's simplified. It's a little bit more complicated in real life because there are things such as parasites and soil microbes and omnivores and other things going on. But in general, this is how energy flows. It starts with the plants. So the vast majority of animals acting as primary consumers are actually insects, such as these aphids shown here on the left. And even most birds that we think of as seed eaters, which by the way is also herbivory, uh, they rely on insects and their larvae in particular to supply protein and fats to their broods. There's some famous studies that show that chickadees require hundreds of caterpillars to raise a brood every year. And even hummingbirds don't just drink nectar, but they're gonna glean some insects and actually fly catch or gnat catch tiny insects at times straight out of midair. And these swallows are a great example of the importance of insects as the uh, adult barn swallow here that is feeding on the right is demonstrating. And I, I, I like this picture because it almost looks like the fledgling is partaking in some predatory behavior, but it's actually being fed by the adult. So let's look at how insects specialize in this herbivory by way of their mouth parts. Yes, entomologists love to talk with their mouth parts and they also love to talk about mouth parts. You can't attend any sort of entomology discussion without the word mouth part showing up. Um, and it's also a good entry point though to see just how specialized insects can be. So check out this stink bug. Unfortunately, the Southern green stink bug, it's not a native insect, but this is one of the better pictures that I have showing off the mouth part. And it is taking advantage of a native species. It's the California coffee berry. It's a berry actually. And you can see what entomologists call a piercing and sucking mouth part. So think of it like a straw that has a very sharp end on it. So, before we get further into that, let's take a look at some other mouth part mo morphologies that will help us in the discussion. So first, it's hard to find a better example of chewing mouth parts than this grasshopper. So it kindly let me actually lay down right in front of it. Um, I think it was on my driveway and I got just inches away from it to take this portrait and you can see the mouth really well here. So these mouth parts do a couple of things. First of all, they're massive and powerful, especially in relation to the size of the insect, and that allows it to chew on very fibrous tissues. There's also a little bit of an overlap, so it can cut a bit like scissors, kind of like an overbite in a human in a way, and they have grinding molar surfaces too. Now it's hard to tell from the picture, but the chewing parts are actually towards the bottom angled downward. So that's thought to be an adaptation to allow it to eat, but continue to keep its eyes up in case a predator were to come along. There's a whole classification. There's a whole set of insects that have these types of mouth parts. Now down a slightly different evolutionary path, we have chewing and lapping such as is seen in many bees and wasps. So again, this wasp here, this is the common honeybee, which is also uh, not native to North America, 
Uh, but it's a good picture that shows the mouth pretty well. So these insects, it's chewing and lapping, which is, you know, they, they use the lapping aspect to gather pollen and nectar. And the chewing part is also helpful for, say, molding wax or other substrates that they might use um, for shelter or for raising their young. Houseflies, and many flies for that matter, are probably the best examples of sponging mouthparts. They will sponge up liquids from a variety of things, including animals and detritus. You may have had the experience of a fly landing on your skin when you're a little bit sweaty, and it's oftentimes gathering up some of that nice salty liquid. And this here, this is actually a surfid fly, sometimes also called a flower fly or a hover fly. Uh, and it has a good example of another slight adaptation of an extendable sponge. So it can actually kind of stick that mouth out and get into areas and soak up nectar. Now on a side note, surfed flies, Michelle was actually asking me this. Um, I'm sorry, no, it wasn't Michelle. It was another open space person was asking me this right before we started, but what, what my favorite insect was. And I said, probably surfed flies um, because they're often overlooked and they perform really important roles of pollination um, and their larvae are actually carnivorous. So this is an example of an insect where in the larval stage has a totally different lifestyle than it does as, as an adult. And those carnivorous larvae will eat aphids. They're a biological control for aphids. And we'll talk a bit about aphids here in a bit. Okay, so next on our short mouth part tour, and that's a phrase that I hope you don't hear every day. If you do, you're either an entomologist or I don't know what you are. Uh, but, but it's uh, siphoning mouthparts. And these are probably most familiar in butterflies and moths. So you can see it here with the monarch on the left. And this, by the way, serves as a good reminder that adult monarchs are generalists. So while the monarch as a whole it has an obligate relationship with milkweed, once it becomes an adult, it can uh, nectar on many different flower types. So they might um, uh, feed on, on milkweed as well, by the way. So these long proboscides, which is the plural of proboscis, it's a fun word, can't just, you know, they can't just let them flop around. So they actually very often will curl them up and tuck them away beneath their head and thorax. And on the right, you can see this monarch is starting to unfurl that proboscis a little bit. And I, I really like this picture because it gives a really good view of just how sturdy and thick that, uh, that these uh, siphoning mouthparts really are. Now we already saw a preview of a piercing and sucking mouthpart with um, the stink bug that I showed earlier. And of course, probably the most notorious insect with this type of mouth is a mosquito, but they're carnivores, right? Well, actually not so much. Only female mosquitoes partake in blood meals and they don't even do it all the time. Very often they're omnivores and you'll find them on flowers. Now, mosquito larvae are also generally herbivores and they'll eat algae and water. Once in a while, they'll, they'll turn to cannibalism though, if they have to. And I mentioned that we would talk a bit more about aphids. So aphids all have these piercing sucking mouth parts as well, but they're super hard to see. I mean, the aphids are small, usually. They're very close to the plant and uh, these mouth parts are usually buried in the plant tissue uh, when you see them or they're tucked away. So I think that aphids are actually a great indicator of biodiversity in any environment. Uh, they're very specialized. Like most of these insects that we're talking about, they have uh, they have grown to adapt based on both their physiology and their ability to withstand the chemical defenses of plants. So they're, they're generally obligates, just like the monarch. So when you have a variety of aphids, it means you probably have a variety of plants and it's a variety of food as well. And speaking of that, here's an aphid doing its trophic duty uh, with a... Um, Oh, I think that's a noble false widow spider that has captured it and uh, it will soon be a meal.
And look at this weevil. So it's weevil time. It's also quiz time. And I want you to think based on what we just went through, what type of mouth part do you think the weevil has? Is it a chewing mouth part, a sponging mouth part, a siphoning mouth part, or one of those piercing sucking mouth parts? I'll give you a moment to think about it and feel free to type an answer in the chat. I admit I can't see the answers until later <laughs> right now. So um, I'll trust that you're doing it. All right, so who said chewing? So yes, this is almost a trick question. That long appendage on its head, it's not a proboscis. It's actually just an elongated head. And actually at the very tip of that head, there are chewing mouth parts that allow it to excavate a hole to feed on those soft internal tissues in a plant. And you can see it put to use here. So there, there's a hole, I think this is a bud, um, an unopened bud of uh, a flower. And this weevil has really been working hard because that hole is like three times its body size. And it's given it access to all of the soft tissues inside. And I think that this weevil here, it's a different species altogether, but it gives you a really good view that maybe makes it easier to see that that's actually just part of its head. So I don't know if my cursor so shows up, but you can see the long extended uh, head with, um, with essentially antenna and the mouth on the very tip and the eyes are even attached to it. So it's a pretty cool look at, um, at this adaptation that gives it ask access to different parts of plants than other insects can get to. And speaking of weevils, and community ecology. So this weevil here is a nut specialist. Specifically, it's an ache, uh, excuse me, an oak acorn specialist, despite the common name having filbert in its name. And it's a pretty cool story. So what it does is it actually lays eggs in developing acorns, and then the hatched larva will eat portions of the insides of the acorn, kind of hollowing out not all of it, but a good chunk of it. And, uh, and that's part of the weevil's life cycle where it then goes and it pupates and turns into an adult. And if you were to Google this wonderful creature or Bing it or whatever search engine is your search engine of choice, you're going to find that most websites will label this a pest, whether you're in British Columbia or California, wherever it exists, a lot of people consider this and a lot of the insects we're talking about as pests. However, I'm going to focus on this one in particular because it does so many things. So first of all, even when it eats a portion of an acorn, many of those acorns can still germinate. Now they don't germinate as, um, as, uh, as vibrantly as, uh, maybe a, an untouched acorn, but they can still germinate and those holes and cavities that they leave behind, they actually provide homes to a variety of other insects. There are moths that depend on using partially chewed up acorns for their life cycle. And there are actually even ants who will move from hollowed out acorn to hollowed out acorn um, in very, very small colonies. And, and that's their strategy for living. So this weevil, it's actually a, truly an ecosystem engineer. It supports so much more uh, beyond just being food itself for other, for other insects. So with that, we're um, not quite halfway in but I wanted to make sure we had a chance to pause and take any questions that perhaps have come up. So, uh, Michelle, I know you've been monitoring. Are there any questions to take at this point? We haven't had any questions come through yet. Okay. Yeah. But if anyone has one, they've been ready to type. We put it in now. All right. We'll give it like a minute, maybe yeah. not even a minute, a few seconds. If nothing comes in, we can move along. That is really cool though. I didn't know that about weevils. Yeah. And, and weevils, like so many things that we're talking about, there are many, many different species of weevils and they themselves generally have specialized relationships with individual plants like this one with the acorn. Um, and, uh, and you know, there are other ones that, that are uh, very specialized too. So, uh, each and every one of these things has this really unique relationship with the plant that it's uh, grown to adapt to. Oh, cool. 
All right, so why don't we move along then? Yeah. All right, so we're talking herbivory, which, you know, is eating plants, as I said. And the most obvious thing to eat on a plant is probably the leaf. And we haven't even talked about leaves yet. So we might think that a leaf is flat, but to a tiny insect, it's really more like a layer cake. And there are the mesophyll layers divided into the tasty palisade layer and the scrumptious spongy mesophyll. And then we have the delectable upper and lower epidermis. And then there are the veins and the midrib, which carry all of that delicious xylem and phloem. And insects have figured out many more novel ways to eat a leaf than we have. Like generally as humans, we just stuff our spinach into our mouth and grind it up and, and eat it. So why don't we look at some of the creative ways that insects have learned to take advantage of a leaf. So I, I like this picture. This was actually taken from one of the open space lands uh, on a bio blitz just, uh, I don't know, a, a month or two ago. Uh, so if you live in the Bay Area and you're, and you're interested in getting out and seeing some of these insects in action and you don't have your own property that you might be able to find them, um, there are uh, there are some bio blitzes that, uh, that happen at North Coyote Valley. Um, and by the way, I'll, uh, I guess I'll include a, a link to that um, in, uh, in my resources here that I'll show you later. But anyway, back on track. For perspective, that thing on the left there, that's actually my thumb. And you can see the midrib and veins of the leaf really well. And I was holding this leaf up to the sun so that I could get a nice backlit shot. And it's illuminating what are essentially little windows in the leaf. And inside each of these little windows is a larva of some sort. And I think you can see that middle one really well. And those aren't curtains in the window, those dark spots, though that's actually frass or excrement. And what we have here, this type of herbivory, it's called leaf mining. And this is actually a moth larva or three moth larvae that are living between the cuticles of the leaf. And I, I still am just amazed by this. Imagine that just living part of your life inside of a leaf. So in fact, discovering leaf miners in my backyard was really one of the pivotal moments that I had where I began to understand the tight relationships that exist between insects and plants. So talking about leaf miners in particular, it's actually extremely common. So much so that Charlie Iceman um, has a leaf mining guide, which, is, which has a key and some other identification uh, elements in it. It covers 3,500 species or presumed species in North America alone. And these range from beetles to sawflies to moths and flies. So a very diverse array of insects have figured out how to uh, basically live part of their life in a leaf. So biologies, uh, biologists and naturalists long ago recognized that insects who partake in this sort of lifestyle have to live in a very tight balance with the plant. Um, but they obviously need to physically fit in the leaf and they have to be adapted to the chemical defenses of the plant. So every plant is trying to keep these insects from eating it. And only a few have unlocked the key for the specific plant. And of course they have to live in an appropriate environment to complete their full life cycle. So in other words, the majority of these insects have an obligate relationship again with the plants that they mine in. So now again, I've actually taken another non-native species here for the sake of example. Uh, and this is a really common one that if you live in California, um, or most of the West coast for that matter, you can probably find. So the, uh, narrow barred pygmy moth takes advantage of roses. And this moth actually was introduced from Europe and the host plant in this case was an ornamental rose. So even if you have ornamental roses, you might be able to see this really interesting behavior. Uh, but by the way, they do also mine our native roses as well. So you can find this out in the wild with a native rose. And here's what the adult moth looks like. It's super tiny. I was really, I was so lucky to even notice it just a couple millimeters long. And uh, I, I wish I had spent more time with it to get an even better photo than I did, but it gives you an idea of, um, of how cute this little thing can be. So back to the mine. I wanted to show in these photos, some of the elements, um, some of the characteristics of a leaf miner. 
So first, you can see that the mines, um, the mines start at the beginning of the mine on both sides of the leaf, the upper and lower. So this means that, um, well, what I want to say actually is, is that, that you see it much better on the upper side. You can barely see it on the lower side. So remember we, when we were talking about the layer cake analogy? This means that the larva here is actually eating more on the upper side, probably the palisade mesophyll and, um, and that upper uh, uh, portion of the leaf. And if you look closer still, there's a tiny little hole, an entry point. And this stigmella species, its lifestyle is such that it lays an egg, the adult will lay an egg on the underside of the leaf. And when that egg hatches, the larva burrows into the leaf and then it begins to uh, eat the inside of the leaf. And you can see as the mine progresses from that starting point, kind of in a squiggly linear manner, it progressively grows wider and that's the larva getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally it exits again on the underside of the leaf. So there's a hole there that's plainly evident. So it exits as a larva and then will go and spin a cocoon somewhere else on the plant and, uh, and then pupate and become an adult. By the way, other species may not follow this exact recipe. They may, for example, drop into the leaf litter and pupate there or pupate in the soil. And some will even pupate within the leaf. And you'll see one here in a moment. So sometimes I think the leaf miners are actually trying to communicate with me, maybe a la Charlotte's Web, though I haven't been able to piece together the messages quite yet. But here's a few examples of a starting point. If you can figure this out, let me know. And then you have other examples of leaf miners. This one is different in almost every way from the one that we just looked at. So first, it obviously doesn't look linear like the one we were just seeing. And in fact, they call this a blotch mine. So if those other miners, if they were trying to write notes to me, scribble out some letters, maybe this one here is performing some sort of psychoanalysis on me along the lines of an inkblot test. I don't know, it looks a little bit like a turtle to me. Not sure what that says or if the insect even understands, but it is what it is. So anyway, this <laughs> the species inserts or oviposits its egg directly into the leaf. Very different from the last one where the larva actually burrowed in. And if, if one were to investigate inside the mine, you would actually see a puparium. That little orange thing there is um, the insect going through pupation and it's attached via some of that frass or excrement to the inside of the leaf. So it's nice and secure in there. So this one will emerge as an adult, unlike the previous one who actually departs still as a lar larva and pupates outside of the leaf. And this, this is what the adult actually looks like. It's a tiny little fly. I really like it. The yellow and black contrast I think is really cool. And, uh, and these are actually quite common. And even poison oak and poison ivy, for those of you uh, further east, has leaf miners. So again, what's toxic to some is food for others who have somehow adapted to the defenses of the plant. So this mine was created by a different member of the stigmella moth genus. And I, I hope you forgive me, I chose not to handle this leaf uh, because it is poison oak, and this is the only photo you get as a result. So I just, I love leaf mines. I love, you know, most of the topics here. And when I show these to people in the field, such as on those bio blitzes I was telling you about a moment ago, they inevitably want to know, like, how do you identify them? How do you know what insect actually caused this? And that's part of the fun. It's a little bit of a mystery. Um, but you can actually identify a lot of these just in the same way that we identify birds or spiders or mammals. We look at colors, sizes, shapes, proportions, habitats of those animals. And we can really do the same for leaf miners. It's just that the field marks and behaviors are a little bit different. So as we established a moment ago, many of these relationships are obligate. So the starting point is identifying the host plant. And thankfully, through the hard work of many others in the past, including Charlie Eisman, who I've mentioned a few times now, um, they've compiled keys and field guides and all sorts of information that really help us uh, use that the host plant as a starting point for 
which insects might be in there. They've actually gone through the effort of raising and rearing the larva from leaf mines to figure all of this out. So often we start then after we know the plant with the shape of the mine, we talked about linear and blotch and I'll pause for a second here to see what you think the shape of this mine is. I guess if the choice is linear or blotch, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's a blotch. And you can also see the frass placement here, all those little black spots. That's uh, that's the excrement. And then there's an exit hole that's, you know, on this side. And if I were to flip the leaf over, there's no evidence of the mine on the other side of the leaf. So those are all clues. Those are all things that we can use. And the frass placement is also helpful. You know, is it all in a clump? Is it in a line? Um, this one here, I think is, is pretty cool looking. All these little squiggly lines is very unique. Um, and then if you are really into it, you can start to look for evidence of eggs, larva, pupation. Um, that can be a little tricky because everything is so small. But if you do find these in the wild, I encourage you to post your photos on iNaturalist. There's a wonderful project called Leaf Miners of North America. Uh, I linked it here. And at the end, I, um, I have a, like a master link and a QR code that you can follow to get access to all the resources that I talk about. But if you post it there, uh, and you can identify the host plant, I think the chances are pretty good that you're gonna get some help with an identification. So it's a lot of fun to start to learn about what's going on around you. Anyway, before moving on, I wanted to show one more adult. This is a Liriomyza fly, which turned out to be quite common in my backyard. It looks very similar to that other one I showed a little bit ago. And I've witnessed spiders and even bush tits eating what I presume to be these flies. It's kind of hard to tell because they are so tiny, but, but they look like it. And that really demonstrated to me the important ecological role that these flies play. And I don't have photos for every type of leaf mining case, but there are leaf miners that specialize in all sorts of plants, even dead and dying tissues and grasses. But some take it even a step further and they will mine plant stems. And the concept is very similar to what we learned about just a moment ago. And in my area here in San Jose, a lot of these stem miners are a different moth uh, genus called uh, Marmara. And, um, you know, I really, I really enjoy finding these. Um, they, they often create interesting patterns as well. Now, taking advantage of plant tissues is one thing. But what if you could induce the plants to grow food just for you? There's a whole bunch of insects that have figured out how to do just that. And I gave a hint, I gave several hints there. Um, I'm gonna pause here and say, can, can anyone guess or identify what this thing is that we're looking at here? So if you guessed a plant gall, you're correct. Uh, these are uh, crystalline galls that are found on a blue oak and they can be really prolific. They can grow on many, many um, of the oak's leaves. And the story here is super fascinating. So there are many organisms that can induce a plant to grow food and shelter just for them. And the most famous is probably the, the uh, snippid wasps, sometimes called oak galling wasps. Uh, but there are species of midges, aphids, moths, mites, um, sawflies that can do all of this as well. Now I say induce because these organisms have to perform very specific actions at a very specific time to make the plant do this service on their behalf. So we'll take a look at some of the gall wasps as an example. Now these are tiny wasps. So if you're envisioning something like a yellow jacket, uh, think much, much smaller. You'd be more likely to confuse them for a fruit fly or a gnat or something like that. And they don't sting either. So some of these wasps are thought to actually induce these growths by timing their activities with budding. So very, very early in the season uh, when, uh, when an oak tree is first budding out. And then when it has a secondary growth period, uh, later like in the, in the summer, uh, those are the opportune times. And what happens um, here is that there's meristematic tissues within the bud that have undifferentiated cells. And what all that means is think of it kind of like a stem cell. 
and it could be made into other things, other aspects of the plant. So these gall wasps, when they inject their egg or eggs, they can do multiple, by the way, um, there'll be some hormones that go along with it. And that actually steers these cells to grow into these very specific structures. So kind of like the leaf mines, you can identify the wasp that created this by knowing the host plant and the size and shape and characteristics of the gall. Now, there are some other cases of galling where it's believed that the larva actually induces the gall uh, by its, uh, its eating, and it may be secreting some hormones or other chemicals as well during feeding to, to cause the gall to grow. There's a lot to learn here. There's a lot that's not known. Um, so it's a really fascinating area of, uh, of study. Some of these growths are really spectacular looking. In fact, this one here I chose as my zoom background. So uh, maybe this picture looks familiar to you. You can see it behind me. Uh, so inside the larva are chewing away, largely protected from the risks of the outside world. You know, what a great method that they've figured out. But there's always someone else who's a step ahead. And there's a huge number of parasitoid wasps that have evolved to try to take advantage of the galls. So they'll come along, as you can see in the upper left, um, and they will attempt to oviposit their own egg into the gall. And they're doing that. There's a couple different methods. Sometimes they'll just stick it in the gall. They'll try to stick it in a cell. Other times they're actually looking for the larva inside and they want to oviposit inside of that larva. Uh, but in either case, it's bad news for the larva. And on top of that, there's another classification of wasps that uh, have, uh, they're, they're called inquilins. And these are wasps that, as my friend, um, Dr. Marav Vonshak likes to say, they're, they're uninvited guests. So the wasp will come along and oviposit inside and the larva doesn't have any intention to go and eat the host larva. Instead, it just wants to eat the meal um, of, of the gall. It wants to partake in the feast that the other, um, the other larva triggered. So this can also be bad news though, for the host. It may, uh, the inquilin may eat up all the resources of the gall and cause the, uh, the larva to fail. So as I like to say, galls are truly fascinating on so many levels. There's so many undescribed and undocumented species such as this one here. Uh, this is, actually an acorn gall. So the wasp came along and in the budding form of the acorn did its thing and it turned it into this crazy looking little green star shape. So inside of that, there's, um, I'm not sure if it's one or multiple larva, but, uh, but they're doing their, um, their herbivory inside of the gall. So a common question that I get is, are galls harmful to the plant? And in some I think uncommon, if not rare cases, they can be, especially if it's out of control or the plant is living on the edge already. Maybe it's already um, uh, drought stricken or there's some other problem. But as I'm gonna invoke the name again, as Charlie Eisman characterized, uh, he says that gall formation is argu arguably beneficial to the plant uh, because it contains the damage that herbivory would normally have to a very small and contained space. So it's an interesting thought, and it leads me to wonder, is this sort of like a truce in the evolutionary arms race where the herbivorous insects and the plants have found a way to get along together and they both get what they want? Well, even if it is a truce, we still have these selective pressures of the parasitoids and the inquilins. So uh, whatever balance that exists right now, who knows what it will look like millions of years from now. So if you're interested in galls, uh, Marav and I gave a couple of webinars and I'll include links to those in the resources later that uh, they're on YouTube, they're easy to find. And if you did attend our gall webinar, uh, you probably saw this photo. It's a pretty cool looking gall, isn't it? It almost looks like the planet Jupiter maybe turned on its side a little bit. So there's Jupiter for comparison, but it's actually not a gall at all. It's a gall-like scale insect. So these are, again, another type of specialized insects. And in this case, and especially the females, they don't have legs. And they're essentially concealed underneath this, these domes, the scale. 
And underneath there, they're then able to chew away and consume the plant using piercing, sucking mouth parts. Now, sometimes these domes are not quite so showy as this one here. They might be low, waxy, cottony, hard or soft. Um, so there's a variety. So here's a different type. This is a soft, waxy scale found on manzanitas. You have to look closely. They're pretty small. And again, uh, you know, this, this waxy scale is produced by the female so that it gets some protection and underneath it is sucking away at the plant juices. There are, by the way, some generalist scale insects, but again, most of these are specific to a genus or sometimes even a species of plant. And of course, this isn't the end of the story. If you haven't uh, seen by now, there are parasitoids and, um, and predators that will come along looking just for these insects. They're specialized. Some of those are beetles and lacewings and other things. And like so many things, it gets even more complicated. So some scales excrete honeydew, which means that ants will even be attracted and protect the scale. And there's probably no better example of ant protective behavior, or dare I say farming or ranching behavior than with aphids. So we're back to aphids. So these zebra-like aphids here with the really ornate wings, um, and by the way, those little ones are also the same aphid species. They're called smoky poplar aphids, and you can find them on Fremont cottonwood or other members of the uh, populous genus. And you can see Argentine ants here. So basically the aphids, they're piercing sucking mouth parts. They're sucking in all of this, um, all of these liquids from the plant and they excrete a sugary honeydew that the ants love. And the ants have learned how to promote that behavior um, from the aphids and get the most out of it. And in return, you know, they, they have an easy meal, so they want to protect these aphids and they will do that. They will actually fend off predators. I went backwards. Let's fix that. Okay. So here's an example of ants fending off one of the common predators of an aphid. This is uh, an aphid wasp that is coming in for a look at this, uh, at all of these wonderful aphids. It, I'm sure it's super excited to see so many aphids, but alas, they have a few ants that are protecting them. So some of these aphid wasps, they use different techniques. They may try to lay their eggs on or in the aphids. Um, and, uh, and then the larva will essentially eat the aphid from the inside out, turning it into a bit of a zombie. It's actually kind of a cool thing. If you see it, uh, when, when the larva is ready to emerge, it actually creates a little hatch in the aphid and, uh, and comes out. So you can sometimes see these hollowed out aphid carcasses with a hatch. And that's what happened. If you see that. Now this wasp here, um, I think this tribe does a more typical wasp thing where it takes the aphids paralyzed back to its nest um, for, for future food for its own um, offspring, but I'm not entirely positive on that. So for what it's worth, I watched this interaction for like 30 seconds before the wasp seemed to give up uh, without success. And when, when it would get really close, those ants could detect it. You know, ants aren't known for, um, you know, for using their sight, they're kind of more chemical communicators, but somehow they detected it and they would kind of rear up and wave their legs around a bit when the wasp got close. It was really fascinating. And at the beginning, I told you that much of this is uh, a, a talk of community ecology, how the insects fit in uh, to the bigger picture. And my goal was for you to walk away with an increased appreciation for the role of insects um, and the role they play in our food webs. So. Uh, let's tie some of these threads together here before we wrap up. So here we have a native plant. It's a Fremont cottonwood. It's a fine native tree that's found in our riparian areas across the West. And I found this catkin gall. Uh, so it's not a normal catkin. It's been galled. And it, to me, it was new. I hadn't seen it before. It turns out it's made by a mite. So now we have the, uh, the mite and the plant. And having never encountered this gall before, I touched it. I wanted to see what it felt like. And the moment I just barely touched it, dozens of ants emerged in a frenzy. And these are a native ant called a uh, velvety tree ant. And if you look even closer still, within the confines of this catkin gall are tons and tons of aphids. So what's going on here? This is crazy. We have a native tree that's supporting a native mite. 
uh, created a gall and that's providing a home for aphids, which then has attracted these ants. And it's pretty safe to assume that all of this activity going on is probably going to attract some spiders or some birds or some other things to come along and eat these insects, connecting all of the food webs trophic levels together. So time's running short. And there's so much more I really would have liked to have shared with you. Things like boring beetles, they aren't boring at all. Um, and the crazy world of tree hoppers and leaf hoppers with their tiny piercing, sucking mouth parts, these things can be so ornate and, and tons of fun. And, uh, you know, as I keep talking about where there are one types of insects, there's going to be some sort of specialist that's preying on it. Like this, um, leaf hopper assassin bug and check out that folded up piercing, sucking mouth parts, really a ferocious predator. If you're a leaf hopper and we haven't talked about mimicry as well. Remember the monarch? Well, this is not even a monarch. This is a viceroy. And um, the availability of all these wonderful plant resources drives mimicry in a lot of different forms. The monarch itself is toxic to uh, many other predators who have learned not to eat it. So the viceroy has evolved to take advantage of that. And this affords it an ability to eat many different plants. It doesn't have to eat the milkweed. It can eat um, I think it's uh, willows and poplars are, are some of its favorite uh, larval food. So it has a bigger selection of food by you know, mimicking a monarch. And then we have even more examples like wasp, these wasp-like and bee-like hoverflies. I wish I could have gotten into all of that, but uh, time is almost up. So I wanted to end though with a few suggestions for those of you who are lucky enough to own or manage some property, whether it's your house or a yard, a patio, or a place of business or a place of worship. Uh, so the, the first tidbit that I have is consider the entire life cycle of our native insects, not just pollination. It's great to help pollinators and provide nectar sources, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. And I like this cartoon because it actually, um, by the way, those bees, they look like a type of native bee. So, so I like that first of all, uh, but it succinctly points out how you can provide a home, you can provide part of a life cycle, but in this case, it's a lawn, it's a hedgerow, and that may as well be plastic to insects. There's no habitat there. So plant as many native plants as you can. Oaks are the all-star plants and um, they support so many different things. And in many places, there are small oaks you might be able to fit into a small space. So if you have an opportunity, look into that, look into an oak. Uh, but if you don't have the space, there are lots of amazing shrubs out there as well. Like here in California, I love my, my coffee berry. That thing attracts so many different insects of all types, full life cycle support. Uh, Ceanothus are great. And I've included a couple of links here that, uh, that you can find. Autumn is a great time to plant, by the way. It allows roots to establish and uh, allow for a big spring growth. Also leave the leaves. This is a catchphrase. You've probably heard it. It's really, it's really catching on. Uh, many insects overwinter or pupate in leaves or just below the ground, and they need that insulation from the leaves. And also don't prune, ideally at all, if you, if you don't have to, but um, uh, wait if you, if you do have to, wait uh, until summer. It's kind of hard to get the timing right. But I wanted to share real quickly another mistake I made with pruning too early. Uh, I, I pruned some hollow stems on one of my shrubs, and I realized partway through, like, oh, no, there's probably something living in here. So I took a look and I found some cells of uh, what I presume to be some native bees. I think there were six cells in the one twig alone. Um, and you see that they're, they're separated by some dirt. I don't even know how many bees I inadvertently destroyed by pruning. So um, that's a, a, a tough lesson that I learned. And uh, to wrap things up, of course, reduce your chemical use. Uh, there's no such thing as really a directed pesticide or fungicide. They're going to affect many, many more things than, than what you're looking to have affected. And lastly, outdoor lights. Uh, this is an emerging area where people are really realizing how bad outdoor lights are for insects. Uh, you've probably heard that moths love lights. Well, actually, they don't love them. They're just compelled to go to them, and they become exhausted and die, as do many other insects. So consider things like motion sensors so the lights will turn off once in a while or using yellow bulbs that don't attract the bugs so much uh, maybe that's even preferable for you if you have a porch you may not want all the insects flying around when you have your light on 
And I think the most important thing is don't worry about being perfect. Just try to be better. You don't have to do all of this. You don't have to replace your entire lawn or, or everything. Maybe that's a good goal to have, but start somewhere. And even if you have an HOA that is getting in the way, you know, you can start small there too. You can replace just a few plants, leave leaves in a corner of your yard. And, um, and you can make it look maintained and intentional within HOA rules. And of course, you know, start to educate the HOA too. So those are some of the basic tips that I have. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for sticking through this with me. Uh, I hope that it's been enjoyable. And um, all the resources I mentioned, I have a link here, uh, podcast.naturesarchive.com slash incredible-insects. And you could also try the QR code. Hopefully that works through Zoom. Um, I, I'm not sure if it gets re reversed or flipped or something. So uh, somebody please let me know if this actually works. Uh, you can take a picture of it and, um, and then go to the link. So Michelle, wow, I only left us a couple minutes. Uh, you did, that was awesome though. I know I learned a lot. And for those wondering, definitely check out Michael's Nature's Archive podcast. I listen to it. I like it a lot. It's awesome. Uh, but yeah, let's run through some of these questions really quick. Someone was asking, um, how big can weevils get? And what was kind of like the general scale of some of those photos you were showing us? Yeah, I, most of it was tiny. So, um, so weevils, I've seen weevils uh, from just a, like maybe three millimeters mm -hmm. to uh, close to a centimeter. Um, most of them are somewhere in between that. So, so they're pretty small. Some of those hoverflies too are quite small. Uh, the big one I showed with that extendable sponging mouth part, that one actually was maybe almost the size of a honeybee um, as an example. Uh, so uh, there's some variance in there, but a lot of what I showed is small. And, uh, you know, I actually, I gave a presentation for, um, in partnership with OSA a couple of years ago about backyard biodiversity. And I talked a little bit about how you can really tune your vision and your senses to start to see small. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, that's a fun one to look at as well, because you can see these things. It just, it takes an adjustment of mindset. That's awesome. Yeah. We actually did have another question about how someone had never seen galls before or noticed, never noticed them, but want to start noticing them. Any tips on how to train yourself to start seeing them? Yeah. Um, so wherever you are, um, I don't know where this person is, but if you're somewhere like, let's, I'll, I'll start with California, somewhere where the leaves are generally still on the trees, uh, or you, maybe you have evergreen trees, look for an oak tree. Oak trees um, are, are great. They're probably the best place to look for galls. And I would say you want to look on the upper and lower surfaces of the leaves. So it does take actually walking up and getting access to the leaf. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes in parks, trees are pruned. So those branches are too high. You can't reach them. Um, now, if you encounter a case like that, when the leaves start to fall, you can actually look at the leaf, leaf litter on the ground and potentially mm -hmm. find galls there as well. So oaks are a good place to start. Um, and talking about scale, some of these galls are, are tiny, you know, yeah. again, a few millimeters. And some of them like the, uh, those uh, crystalline galls that I showed, they can be two, three centimeters, uh, maybe bigger. So they can be quite noticeable. Uh, so there's a, a variety. And yeah, it, it takes a little experience, but... I think most people can find them. Okay. And uh, someone wanted to clarify, was it female wasps that live inside the gall? Oh, um, that's, that's a great question. So, uh, and, and there's not one answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. um, there, there is, uh, you know, some are parthenogenic and, um, and some actually have sexual cycles as well. Um, it really depends on the species and also the seasonality. So there's some fascinating things that go on there. Um, I, I'll say, uh, if you want to learn more about that, follow this link here and look for the webinar, uh, that Marav and I did. And I, I love when the answers to science questions are, well, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, then... I, I love it too. Just, just to mm -hmm. throw out an opinion. Um, if everything was just like a, a yes or no, uh, answer, it wouldn't be nearly as fascinating and it wouldn't be nearly as diverse and, um, and it'd be a lot more fragile than, um, you know, the, than it is. So I think that, right. you know, th these are all good things. Yeah, it's very true. And the last question we have on here, can plants die from miners using their leaves? Probably. Um, <laughs> I, I've seen some, some vegetables like in vegetable gardens, really, really heavily infested with miners. 
and in those cases it's usually you know the the vegetable is um is not a native plant and we don't have the balance the you know biological controls that you might have with a native uh with a native garden so things can get out of control really fast in those cases mm -hmm. um so uh, I, I have seen at least if if not dying from leaf miners i've seen cases where plants suffer and your uh, overall crop is going to be reduced um, I, I know there are some trees that can get heavy infestations as well insects really follow boom and bust cycles um, and uh, when things are a little bit out of balance the the boom can be a little bit much and plants may have a down year uh, but uh, i think for the most part they don't die outright but there's probably exceptions to that awesome Cool. That's all our questions. Uh, for there, a few people also asked. Yes, this has been recorded, and once we're finished processing the video, it will be resent out to all of you. So if you want to rewatch it, you want to share it with other people, free, feel free. It's coming up. All right. Well, I want to thank thank you, Michelle, for yeah. facilitating this, and thank everyone who stuck it out. Um, if you want to contact me, yeah, follow the link and um, I'm happy to answer questions offline or after the fact. So thanks again. Awesome. Thanks for doing this, Michael. Bye everyone.